I think mental shifts you can make in terms of your perspective are some of the most powerful things you can do. A few examples. In the example of following up, if you have the perspective of, oh, me following up is going to annoy the person, every time you send it, you're going to say, I'm an annoying person, I'm annoying this person. Versus if you flip the perspective to, I'm doing this person a favor by reminding them. You've completely 100%. flipped it. And the truth is, we just don't realize this because it's in our day in life. Before we hopped on here, I was finishing up a meal because I skipped lunch. I had a late lunch. I realized I have to sign up for a doctor's appointment. We have to price something for a new partner. I need to buy an AC for the apartment. All of those things. And if you happen to send the DM at that time, do you think I'm going to respond? Absolutely not. If no. anything, you're doing me a favor by following up and not following up with the copy paste message, but you're just following up and you're doing me a favor and you're increasing the chances of, hey, actually, maybe I do have the time bandwidth and it's a good fit for whatever that might be whoever you're reaching out to. Welcome back to the Virtual Ventures Podcast, episode 27. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez, and today I'm joined by Arjun Mahadevan. He is the CEO of Doula, helping people launch their US company from anywhere in the world. He is a YC alum and on a mission to help 1 billion people start their dream business. We hope you enjoy this episode and we ask that you like and subscribe to continue to help us book amazing guests like Arjun. Enjoy this episode. Arjun, thank you so much for coming on the show, dude. Appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. And looks like we have very similar Zoom. Well, they're not Zoom backgrounds, but similar curtain backgrounds. Yeah, you would think maybe we're in the same office or same studio, but I, where are you located? I think we're pretty far away from each other, actually. I'm in New York. It's funny. I didn't do this here, but what I started doing is on actual Zoom calls, I updated my profile to be Arjun Mahadev in parentheses, New York, because typically on a Zoom call, the first question is, oh, you know, where are you based? <laughs> And it's funny, I think out of habit, sometimes people still ask. So the next level thing to see would be New York, comma, 65 degrees and sunny, because people also like to ask about the weather on the beginning of Zoom calls. But I'm in New York, it's hot here, but really excited to be on today. Yeah, I'm in Miami and I can promise you it's hotter here. It has just been outrageous, like what a crazy summer. But dude, thank you so much for coming on. I've been seeing your stuff nonstop on Twitter lately. And I was like, I saw a few friends like Callum had you on the show. And I've just been super interested to, to kind of pick your brain, learn a little bit more about you and get to ask you some questions that I think are going to be super interesting for all the listeners. But I like to kind of set the tone right at the beginning and give you an easy question. And it's, who are you? Tell us a little bit about your story and what you've accomplished. Who am I really starts with my parents, but something I saw recently was that if you go back enough generations, there are, well, it's really a math equation, but two squared is your parents, there's two parents, then they have their parents, so two squared is four, then you get to eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. And if you keep going back, you get to 4,000 plus people who were really there to create you and the opportunity you have today. But I won't go back 4,000, I'll start just <laughs> one level back. And my parents were actually born and raised in India in Chennai and ended up moving to England to start practicing medicine, both doctors. My mom's an anesthesiologist and my dad's a radiation oncologist. And in England, believe it or not, that's where my brothers and I were born. And I say believe it or not because, as you can tell, I have zero accent. <laughs> and when I was six years old, my parents decided to immigrate from England to America, to Boston specifically. Now, while I don't have a British accent, people also say I don't have a Boston accent. So I guess you win some, you lose some. But when <laughs> I moved to Boston, at the time, it was a new neighborhood, new scenery, new school, new friends. I was there until high school, where I then went to school at the University of Pennsylvania, where I studied mathematics undergrad in the College of Arts and Sciences and statistics in the Wharton School of Business. At the time, I had no clue or reason why or reason to understand why my parents decided to move. At the time, again, it was just new friends, new school, trying to fit in, all those types of things where, you know, now that you're older, you try to stand out. But... Now I've asked my parents why they did it. Why would you fly across an ocean? Why would you restart your residencies, restart as doctors? And what they said was, it's the opportunity in America, the cultural mixing pot in America, which really isn't present anywhere else in the world to the scale in America, the upward mobility, the career opportunities, education, and ultimately entrepreneurship, the ability that truly anyone, you can do this anywhere in the world, but the rags to riches stories, the people who came here with nothing and were able to grow out a business and grow out a financial livelihood for themselves going forward. 
And obviously when I was six, I wasn't plotting and thinking about these things. But after going to school, I was really infatuated with technology. I saw these tech companies, I was using tech and I thought, okay, I wanna go work in San Francisco. I wanna go work at a tech company. My first flight to San Francisco was for an interview at this company called Dropbox. They had raised some money. They were growing fast on campuses. I think that's how I first learned about them. And their program was for non-technical undergrads who wanted to break into tech. That was me in a nutshell. And got the interview, got in. My second flight was to San Francisco. And I was there for over three years, almost four years. And that's when the second thing happened, which is when you're in San Francisco, and I kid you not, this is my walk to work. I would first pass the Twitter office, then I would pass the Uber office, take a right on, I believe, Second Street. Then I would pass the LinkedIn office, probably pass another couple of the startups, which at the time are now massive. Then I would get to Dropbox, which is on the same street as Airbnb and Pinterest. And when you do that wow. every single day, you start to realize, whoa, these companies were put into the world by other people. And at the same time, everywhere you go in San Francisco, you meet other people who are starting their own businesses, trying to start people older than you, younger than you, it doesn't matter. Anyone you meet could be working on something. And that plants the seed in your brain of, hey, what if I did that? What if I could do that? And eventually that itch became too much to just scratch. I had to go, I don't know what the analogy is, but I had to go scratch the itch and fully take the plunge. And I ended up leaving, worked on a few things. First thing was a social fitness app, which didn't fully work out, but I learned a lot and ended up getting into YC with an idea, which we then pivoted from and that became Doula. And the long story is short there is the first company ended up paying lawyers tens of thousands of dollars to get the company started. At the time, thought it was, hey, just the cost of doing business. Didn't realize, wait a second, it was a rather cookie cutter process. Parts of it can be automated or initialized where you click a button and what if you could spin up a bank account and have your tax filings handled and get a CRM set up with HubSpot and integrate with Google to get your Gmail account set up. What if all of that could just be automated so that Founders can focus on what they do best while a company handles the rest. And that was really where Doula began, taking this idea of founders, everyone I believe has a dream idea or side hustle inside them. What if you could make it click button easy for them to take that dream and turn it into their dream business? And I'll share one quick story here on a moment very early on when I realized truly everyone has a side hustle inside them. Officially, it started Doula. It was September of 2020. I was back home in Pennsylvania where my parents lived at the time. And I thought, okay, if I can't explain what I'm doing in basic terms to my parents, I'm in trouble. I'm gonna have to explain this thing thousands yeah. of times. Let's try it. And I was telling my parents, oh, we help people form the LLC. What's an LLC? It's a limited liability company. Why do you need one? Well, if you're outside the US, if you wanna to sell to US customers, having a company is a way to get an EIN, employer identification number, which is a way to get a bank account, which is a way to achieve the ultimate job to be done, which is accepting payments in dollars from US customers or from anywhere in the world. And you also have to do these tax filings and oh, bookkeeping, there's these things called annual reports, so I'm explaining this. And then as I'm going through, my dad says, oh yeah, I have an LLC. And I spat out my coffee, I wasn't even drinking any because my dad had never mentioned he had an LLC. I don't think he mentioned to anyone, I don't know if my mom knew too. And he said, yeah, you know, my friends and I, he's a doctor, and this, I guess this is what doctors do, they would share x-rays with each other or specific files and like give opinions on them. And the file type for these x-rays wasn't supported by a Dropbox or a Google Drive. And his idea was, what if I could make a Dropbox for these type of files where I can upload them, easily share them, and my friends could see. And he had gotten an LLC with a company called LegalZoom, which many folks know. And even for that company though, he couldn't find his employer identification number. He didn't have a business bank account still. He was still doing things through his personal account. And I realized then, one, my dad had a side hustle, didn't even tell anyone. I had no clue. And then two, he lives in the US and he's been here for a while, but even then just the basics of getting the company off the ground were challenging. And I've seen that story time and time again, where people can be inspired by someone else. I think everyone has some entrepreneurial itch inside them. You don't have to go out and raise hundreds of millions of dollars of venture capital to start a business. You can start by consulting. You can be a tutor. You could sell things on Amazon and you can be a podcaster. Like there's so many different industries and jobs and ways to make money and turn a passion into an idea that didn't exist before, which are now possible because of low code website builders, payment platforms. And we eventually hope because of Doula, we're making it that easy so that we can single-handedly with the help of our team, customers, investors, partners, and most importantly, customers who trust us <laughs> to increase entrepreneurship globally. Dude, 
Mic drop right there. That was absolutely amazing. Like so much for us to unpack now. And what an amazing story too. Like it's, it's, it seems like at least a common theme that most of the people I've had on the show either had a tough upbringing or had a immigration story, whether it was them or their parents. And it seems like that's a, b- a big driver for you as you go through and, and create this business. But I want to start all the way at the beginning of your journey, and then we'll build up to get to that doula story. And you started with a small snow plowing business. When did you realize that you had the entrepreneurial itch? When you're in Boston, it snows several feet every winter. And back then it was, okay, everyone grabs shovels. My brothers and I, we go inside and do the driveway. And at the time, this was, I think, in middle school. And we did our driveway, then realized there's neighbor's driveways. And I forget how it happened first, but it's, wait a second, what if we just shoveled the other neighbor's driveway and realize, oh, wait, they'd pay us for that too. And then it turned into, okay, what if you just wake up a little bit earlier and you get all the driveways? And then, oh, what if I tell them, hey, next time it snows, here's my number, I'm the next person. And then the next level it got to was we bought an electric snowblower for our house. And then it was, hey, wait a second, dad, can we use this to go do other houses to increase our output? And then it was, I had a friend who also had an electric snowblower. What if he joined too? And now we have two electric snowblowers and a shovel and there's another neighborhood we can go to. And that was the start of it. It was just something we did when it snowed, but I think it was fun to sort of think through that. And look, I'm not going to say back then I was plotting and saying, ooh, did this snow shovel business in 20 years, I'm going to go apply to an accelerator and try this venture capital. No, but I do think those types of things, I guess, showed me that it is fun to do. Yeah, It's fun to help solve problems for other people. It's fun to make some money while you're doing it too. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess that's my lemonade stand story. But I think the other thing I've thought about too, just from back then is I've always found it's been fun to present yourself or present information in creative ways. And I mentioned this earlier, but I think when you're growing up, especially for me, it was different where I'm coming from England, of course, my family's from India coming. And growing up where I did outside of Boston and Brookline, there are Indians there, but it's not a very heavily Indian population. So I was one of the only people who looked like myself or had my background growing up. I think any kid really wants to fit in. You're trying to fit in. You don't want to stand out. And even then, I think things that I did maybe a little differently were in presentations, I'd always try to be creative or do something unique. But I think it's very interesting or ironic because I think part of growing up is realizing, at least I think, fitting in is boring. I actually joke, but I think it's true. I say normal is a dishwasher setting. I don't want to be normal. I like people who are are eccentric. I like people who have a little flair, who have something different. I wouldn't want to meet someone and just have them say, oh, he was normal. I have nothing to say. And I think that doesn't mean you have to be outlandish or do things for the sake of being garish or garnering attention. But I do think it's just very funny. And again, part of that evolution of going through these things like childhood and realizing that life's too short just to try to fit in, you realize, no, I do want to stand out and either through work or through things I'm doing, do interesting things, which I do think attracts other interesting people too. Yeah, I agree. And it's funny, I was filming an episode yesterday and I was talking with someone and and we had a similar conversation and it was having a little bit of swagger. Like it's not a bad thing. It's, It's a good thing. Have a little bit of color in the things that you do. Like I feel like getting people's attention and, and getting people to remember you is becoming harder and harder. So if you're just cookie cutter, black and white, you have no chance at this point. You have to have that swagger. You have to have that little bit of different about you that sets you apart from the group. And I think this kind of parlays directly into my next question. I mean, you went to the Wharton School of Business. You're around amazing people. Everybody was kind of funneling into the finance route. And you said, okay, let let me try that. And then you left your job on Wall Street because you wanted to go get onto the tech scene. What was joining Dropbox like? That's a lot of people's dream. This podcast is geared towards people wanting to start side hustles and entrepreneurships. But I'm also a huge advocate for, it's not for everybody, like go get a really high paying nine to five. And big tech is kind of that area too. So what was that experience like? At the time, very first thing about going to, this can happen at any college, but I think at Wharton University of Pennsylvania, in high school, you you do well to a certain degree. Um, whether it's, again, these aren't the only metrics, but sure, there's certain standardized tests you take, like the SAT, there's your grades, there's extracurriculars, and there's the interview application, et cetera. So yes, there's a holistic process, but you have to be 
to get into any college, but there's a certain tier or a certain criteria which you have to meet or hit. And what can happen then is you can feel sort of like a big fish in a small pond. Uh, you're doing well and stuff, and look, it, it maybe gets to your head a bit like, oh, like, yeah, hey, you know what? Like, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, this is working. Then you get dropped into Penn or Wharton, or it doesn't, again, doesn't have to just be that school, but I think this happens anywhere, whether it's in New York or in San Francisco, but you get dropped into this community and very quickly you realize, holy crap, there are some really talented people out here. You just didn't realize because you're in this small bubble of the world. And I think the cool thing about tangent social media is that you get access to these people and can realize that even quicker. But very much going to Penn was incredible because I think the single biggest thing is the people you meet. And that levels you up. I firmly believe you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. There's the five quote. chimps theorem. They've studied chimps at the zoo. They look at five of them and you can predict the behavior of one chimp by studying the other four. That's no surprise that happens with humans. It's backed up by Dunbar's number. You know, you can have very five very close relationships or one, one very close personal one, five, then there's the next 15, 50, whatever the numbers are. But that was the single biggest thing. And some of my closest friends to this day, I met at school. And I think part of the reason why they still are my friends is they level me up. We push each other and I've met other people too. But that was the single biggest thing from school. But the downside of that is when you are young, you're sort of expected to know what you're going to do later. And I remember when I was young, I think when people would ask, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? The answer I gave was a pilot, flying planes. Why? Because I didn't know many jobs. There's policeman, fire, firefighter, pilot, doctor, teacher, lawyer. Because you've just heard those things, but yep. podcasting, analytics, business formation API, I had, no, I had no clue what these things are, what these jobs could even exist in the future. And reason I'm going into this is that at school, when you see all your smart friends around you going into finance, you think, whoa, wait a second, maybe that's what I should be doing. And it can be a positive, it can be a downside, but I actually interned on Wall Street. I was working at Morgan Stanley doing sales and trading, and I did it because very candidly, Seemed like it could be fun. I was studying math. I was quantitative. I liked the fast-paced nature. And yeah, a lot of smart friends were doing finance. So I thought, let's give this a try. But when I was doing the internship, I realized very quickly, I was fascinated by not just the movement of the stock price, but the underlying company and what was moving that price. And specifically the tech companies. I just found them interesting. I only pitched tech companies. When we would do rotations on the trading floor, I would sit next to the tech stock traders. We had a stock trading challenge that summer. And they said, oh, it's not an actual challenge. It's for fun. But obviously, people took it competitively. There were 50 of us. Of course. And you get to pick stocks. They give you $20 million of cash to invest. Very first day or first week, people are making very small investments. I came in hot. I said, you know, we're going to make a big bet. So I bet all my capital on the Bank of Greece, which at the time was going through a potential default. Uh, was it going to get default or bailed it out? So was it going to default or get bailed out? I bet the wrong way. And my value went down to several million. And it was embarrassing. People, were, they showed the scoreboard. I was at the very bottom. And what I did was after that, I said, okay, you know what? No more coin flip type bets. <laughs> I'm just going to invest in stuff, which I think I have an edge on or feel like I actually understand. And it was all tech stocks. Yelp beat earnings. And there were a couple other companies, I think Netflix beat earnings, whatever it might be. But quite being excited, I ended up winning the challenge that summer. And uh, just from doing the tech stocks, come back and... From that, I realized, okay, I want to go work at a tech company. And you're totally right. I think everyone has a side hustle, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to quit your job and start a business. You can do something on the side. And I think the other thing here is that you also don't have to turn something you're passionate about into your job, into a way that you make money from. If anything, that can actually that. ruin the hobby. And in this case here, I wanted to work in tech, but I didn't know at the time, like, oh, I want to leave and fully try to start a business. And there's many hobbies and things which I'm interested in. I like to play piano every once in a while, but I don't think I'm going to try to turn that into a job or a way to make money specifically. And I think that's where it does become interesting to think there's a small circle, I think, of people who are actually doing something every day that they're ecstatic about, and it's a job. I think it's a massive luxury to do that. And that's okay then. You can have the two separated. But working at Dropbox was incredible because at these larger companies, they need people who can come in and have an impact from the beginning. There's a cost to investing and educating and ramping someone up. And what Dropbox did was say, hey, you have zero technical background. So you've done business statistics, you're quantitative, but we're going to ramp you up and teach you. And taught me from scratch analytics. I was a PM. And beyond grateful for that, most importantly, the mentors and the leads who taught me there. Yep. 
if I had to do it backwards, again, you can say that you get lucky. And I think I did. I saw the Dropbox. I saw Dropbox at a career fair and I ended up applying from there. I guess my application went well. I met someone there who liked me during the interview, liked me, et cetera. But I also do think the harder you work or the more you put yourself out there, the luckier you get. I was at that career 100%. fair. Why did I decide to go there? Probably just for the serendipity. I wasn't sitting at home just doing nothing all day. And you don't know and you can't have the full plan going forward, but whether it's talking to you on this podcast, you doing the podcast, taking those small bets or meeting people, having those conversations, sending a tweet. I like to say all of those are just examples of asymmetric opportunity, asymmetric upside. You do this small thing, nine times out of 10, 90 times out of 100, nothing will come from it. But those 10 times, something will. And at the end of the day, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. You meet Dropbox at the booth. Oh, not technical founders, boom, you're ready to go because you've been thinking about it, you've been doing research, et cetera. So very grateful for the opportunity to go there. And you can't connect the dots looking forward, but in hindsight, it's not that you don't have to live in San Francisco and work at Dropbox to start a company, but that was incredibly informative in the path now to having worked on a company myself is that I saw people doing it. You build that confidence. And coming back, final thing to one thing you said about the swagger, I don't think you come out of the womb with that. You absolutely do no. With, with swagger, with edge, whatever you want to call it, I truly believe everyone is making it up as they go. Fake it till you make it is so true. Fake it till you make it. And the belief comes before the ability in any, you have to believe it's possible. And the first time you fake it and it works or it comes off well, I'm not just talking about the attitude, but anything, public speaking, a new sport, a new skill, you stumble, you try it. But then the only way you build that identity is by doing it over and over again. My favorite example of this is, you are, I don't know, if you like to ski, you say you like to ski, why do you say that? It's because you didn't just go skiing once five years ago. And you probably didn't just go once two years ago. And you probably don't even go once a year, but you probably go several weekends per year. And it's just the repetitions of that habit, the repetitions of doing the thing, which give you the identity. But that's a long, wind, long winded way to say, just do more of whatever you want to become and you will become that. Quite literally, that's the formula. Yeah. I mean, I, there's so many things in there that you just called out that I love. And I think this podcast for me was like the best definition of fake it till you make it. I always wanted to do a podcast, didn't have any following whatsoever. <laughs> I just started tweeting and I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to commit. I'm going to give it a try. And what's the worst case scenario? People don't answer my DM and come to know it. I've booked so many amazing guests like you through a simple one, two, maybe three DMs, because I feel like a lot of people DM once and then it's like, oh, they ignored me. No, they're probably just busy and didn't see it. The amount of guests that I have booked on just not being annoying and sending 30 DMs, but every three, four days, hey, just wanted to check in and you saw that. It's just insane how that little bit of extra effort has gotten me to this point. And it's like surreal. It's literally been fake it till you make it. Like, what qualifications did I have to be a podcaster? None. But that's one of the beautiful things about this. Like, get up here and start trying. And like the me that started on episode one to the me now, I think this is maybe my 28th or 29th episode filming is just light years of difference. And I, I think that's awesome. And one of the things that you mentioned there, something I had written down, I was looking through your tweets and the asymmetrical opportunity is something you're very, very passionate about. You've spoken about it many times on podcasts or through Twitter. Unpack that for people that might not know really what that is. Anything you do has an input and then there's an output. Something you're physically doing, time you're investing, money you're spending, you're putting something in and there's going to be some return. And the concept of asymmetric opportunity is there are asymmetric upside opportunities and asymmetric downside. Asymmetric downside is when you do something and there's a major possible downside scenario from it. And I'll give an example, but... The asymmetric upside is the thing which is more interesting, which is where you do the small thing or gesture or task or initiative, and there's way more upside from it versus what you put in. Now, there's a whole suite of things too where there's linear output where you put something in and you get it out, but the asymmetric upside opportunities to me are very interesting. So I'll give an asymmetric downside opportunity first. Let's say you're at the store and you want to buy some gum and the gum's sitting right there. Five gum. You're feeling fancier. You don't want to buy try it and you want five. You could take the gum and put it in your pocket and walk out the door. And you saved 362. I don't know how much five gum is. You saved a couple bucks. Amazing. You saved a couple bucks. 
if you invest that in in 40 years when you retire, like that's $400, whatever it might be, but, yeah. but you save four bucks. The downside scenario though, is the camera sees you steal, you committed a crime and it's on your record and that's gonna impact you and negatively hurt you. Obviously you shouldn't steal, but the point here is that, yeah, you can maybe save a couple bucks and whatever you want it to do with that money, but there's asymmetric downside. You can go to jail, there's fines, et cetera. On the other end, Asymmetric upside opportunities are things where you put an initial investment in, which really I think the only price for a lot of these things is your pride and not being scared. But you do those things and then there's asymmetric upside or return that can come. So my, some of my favorite examples, sending a DM using the example you just sent. All you have to do is however fast you can type, go into Twitter, make sure the person has messages open and just send them a message. Worst thing that happens is they don't reply. Best case is they do respond and maybe that person ends up becoming, and this has happened in the last few years, one of your first investors in your company, a person who ends up joining your company, someone who then becomes a close friend who you meet in person and have established relationships with since then. That's one example of sending the DM. The same thing applied for cold calling someone. Favorite example of this is Elon Musk actually cold called rocket expert Jim Cantrell to sell him on his idea of building rockets. It was a cold call. That cold call, and look what happened now. There's SpaceX, and there's yeah. many other companies from that. There are other examples too. Creating content is another one that I love. That could be writing, that could be blogging, that could be recording a podcast, recording video. You put that time in, you create it once. Content is truly the original software. It can be replicated infinitely, millions of times from that initial input, and anyone can see it. They might not respond, you might not see the impact it has on them, but that content is out there and will live forever. You could go to a cocktail party. You could meet people there, the serendipity of putting yourself out there. It could be a career fair, it could be a cocktail party, whatever it might be, but you going there in that short amount of time and not just standing in the corner, but actually going up, talking to people is a way that you're gonna create that connection. And again, you never know where that could go. It could be approaching someone. You could go up to talk to someone. It could be someone that you're attracted to. It could be someone that just looks interesting. Someone who's reading a book that you're interested in and all of a sudden you have three more book recs and one of those book recs actually leads to a transformative moment in your life. But all these types of things, creating content, talking to someone, cocktail parties, tweeting, cold emails, sending the DM, they're all examples. If you put in this a little amount of work, the only thing really I think stopping you is the fear of, oh, what if the person doesn't talk to me? Or what if the person doesn't respond? But so much more upside can come from it. And I think in life, the more of those things you can do, the more upside you have, the more surface area or seren surface area for serendipity you have, and I also do think that the best way to think about this, or I think about it, is the odds of getting struck by lightning are incredibly low, 0.0001%, less than that, more zeros. But if I got a 20-foot metal pole and I ran around with that 20-foot metal pole, the odds increase exponentially, massively. But it's still 0.001, there's a lot of zeros, but just by that act of running around with the pole, you've massively increased your chance of, running by light of getting struck by lightning. So I like to think, what can I do daily each day to get struck by lightning? And I think also coming back to, because I love what you said, this point on, you know, whatever, having the swagger, those things, this same thing is a muscle you build. I'm sure the first time you sent the DM, your heart rate probably elevated, maybe your fingers were sweating. Now it's like, yeah, I'm going to send 10 DMs today and I'm not going to think twice if someone doesn't respond. If anything, I'm going to follow up in three days and then I'm going to do it again because I know that, and you've seen it now, you've built the muscle, if I do this enough times, respectfully, not in a non-annoying way, showing a little personality and actually learning about the person I'm messaging, then I could get a guest on my podcast or get an interview at a company I'm trying to work. And I think it's just a really powerful concept to minimize asymmetric downside opportunities or bets and shoot your shot and maximize the asymmetric upside ones. Yeah, and, and it's funny because you've mentioned this on other podcasts too, like being scared, being nervous, that never goes away. You just learn how to just deal with it like you learn how to just, that's part of the game that's part of what's going to happen it's never going to stop what you're doing is always going to be a little nerve-wracking but learning to just continue to push forward is huge and before i started sending dms i'm in my head i'm like i don't want to follow up again because that's annoying but what, what am i even thinking like thinking back that doesn't make any sense like this person doesn't know me sending two DMs over a span of three days with me asking them to give me some of their time so that I can give them a lot of my time and share their story. 
at what point would somebody find that annoying? And if they did find that annoying, it's probably not somebody I want on the show. So it's just those little things where you like, and then of course, when it worked, it's like, whoa, like (laughs) this just opened up this whole new like universe for me here. And we talked about creating content there. You create amazing content, especially on Twitter. You highlight some amazing entrepreneurs and a lot of women entrepreneurs that I think are amazing. I was just going through all of them and seeing these super impactful stories. I think this is a great segue to ask probably my favorite question I had on here and talk about how a scheduled post changed your life. If you the know funny thing is, the, the funny thing is I didn't mean to post it. It was an accident. It was an accident, but it did change my life where this comes back to the concept you were talking about, about the fear of what are people going to think? And one thing I actually want to add to what you said is that I think mental shifts you can make in terms of your perspective are some of the most powerful things you can do. A few examples. In the example of following up, if you have the perspective of, oh, me following up is going to annoy the person, every time you send it, you're going to say, I'm an annoying person, I'm annoying this person. Versus if you flip the perspective to, I'm doing this person a favor by reminding them. You've completely 100%. flipped it. And the truth is, we just don't realize this because it's in our day in life. Before we hopped on here, I was finishing up a meal because I skipped lunch. I had a late lunch. I realized I have to sign up for a doctor's appointment. We have to price something for a new partner. I need to buy an AC for the apartment. All of those things. And if you happen to send the DM at that time, do you think I'm going to respond? Absolutely not. If no. anything, you're doing me a favor by following up and not following up with the copy paste message, but you're just following up and you're doing me a favor and you're increasing the chances of, hey, actually, maybe I do have the time bandwidth and it's a good fit for whatever that might be, whoever you're reaching out to. One example of that is, again, if you're not annoying someone, you're doing them a favor by respectfully following up. Another one is of my favorites is you don't have to do it. You get to do it. Oh, I don't feel like exercising in the morning. I don't have to. I get to. I'm healthy. I can walk. I can have the energy to go do this. Insane flip there. On the days now when I feel like I don't want to, it's no, I get to. And that small shift has a big difference. And coming back to, I guess, the scheduled post, which did change my life, the fear is what really stops you from, I think, putting out content posting because you're so concerned about what others will think. And there's always going to be people who are critics. It's so easy to be a critic. The loudest boos often come from the cheapest seats, meaning they're yep. people who aren't in the game themselves. They're just sitting out there behind a keyboard, criticizing, 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 but never in the arena themselves. And in this case, this is a very long-winded introduction to the story, but I had left Dropbox And when I applied to Dropbox four years before that, I wrote this idea down for an app I wanted to build. Dropbox has this thing called Hack Week. And in Hack Week, you can build anything you want. I wanted to build a fitness app to coordinate workouts with friends. Instead of Strava for biking or running, hey, let's go play tennis or let's go work out together. Cool, we can coordinate here. And I left Dropbox. I was non-technical, but I was hacking on these low-code, no-code builders. And I, I built and developed an app. And I was asking friends, family, people to use it, but I was thinking it's time to launch this thing. And at the time I said, okay, I'm going to launch or write a medium post. I'm going to post it on Twitter. And I think for a week or two, I just procrastinated by, oh, it's not ready. I have to edit. The app's not ready, et cetera. And then finally I said, I'm going to post this thing on Sunday morning. And that previous Saturday, I stayed up super late. I was getting it done. I got to hit the deadline. Then in the morning, it was time to post. I think it was 9 a.m. Pacific. And I said, I just don't feel like doing it. I don't think it's fully there. But what I had forgotten is I had scheduled the post to go out on Medium. And I actually tried to unsend it because I was that scared, that worried about it's not ready. Oh, this is embarrassing. But the post went out, so the show had to go on. And I said, okay, the post is out. I'm going to post the Twitter thread too. For my standards back then, the post went viral. I think now things have compounded and it's cool (laughs) to see certain posts go more viral than others. But at the time, it went viral for my standards. And two important things happened there. First. I realized the app I was working on was a bad idea. Not that the solution shouldn't exist in the world, but it exists in other ways and my solution was not a 10X improvement. There was not product market fit. People signed up for the app, the retention wasn't there. And instead of being upset about that, I was thankful. And anything, my biggest concern, the biggest thing I was upset about is why didn't I do this earlier? I could have found out this earlier. I was just too scared to put it out there. But the second thing, and this is why it changed my life, is by putting it out there, I got reached out to someone else sent a DM to say, hey, this is a cool idea. Can we chat? And that ended up being an investor who ended up making some connections in the future. And those connections led to effectively Doula today, a a combination of introductions, connections. And 
the crazy thing to me there is I think, what if that Medium post wasn't scheduled? Would I have posted it a week later? Would I have found some excuse not to? And it's kind of the butterfly effect. You can always connect the dots in hindsight, but it's crazy to think, what if that didn't happen? And for me, that's just a fun story because even for creating content, I'm sure there's times when you're, you still, you've done the DMs, it's worked. You're still scared to send it. The butterflies are still there. There's still days when in the morning, I'm about to press post. I'm thinking, eh, it's not fully ready. I could tweak it some more. Eh, this feels a little cringe, whatever it might be. And the only way to squash those demons is to do it and do it again. And every single day you have to put that away. It doesn't go away. It's, it's like, I like to think about this in terms of health and fitness. You can, anything, training for basketball, soccer, lifting weights, running. You put in the work, you train, you train. But you, unfortunately, you don't get to hit pause like a video game and just maintain that level. You have to keep doing it forever to maintain it. And actually, you have to increase the input of either repetitions or volume, which would be repetitions, or the weight, if you will, the intensity in order to see improvement. You have to do compounding progress. And there's no pause in life in anything. You have to keep squashing the demon, keep adding more volume to improve. So it's crazy to think, what if that post didn't go out? But if anything, it's a bigger sign now that try to take the emotion out of it do the thing daily if it's posting, if it's stick to the schedule, if it's sending to the DMs. And the muscle will build, but oftentimes you just need the discipline. And if you can do it in a disciplined manner, then the results will come. You just have to stick with the game for long enough. I feel like we've been on this whole journey with you now, and it's time to get to what we really came here for. Break down Doula as a business model. Tell us what you have going on, what you're excited about within that company. And for somebody who may be listening and might want to try you guys out, what should they be looking for? One of the most fun yet scary things about any business is that there is no gaming the system. There's no gaming the market. There's no gaming customers who will or won't pay. Sure, maybe your friend will be the first customer if they like you, but if they don't find value in the product, they're not going to retain the next year. And yeah, maybe your family will buy the first issue or watch the first episode, but if random strangers you've never met aren't coming in and buying, Money is an exchange of value. Revenue is a business when revenue exchange hands. Even if you're a usage-based app, eventually paying customers is what makes a business. And the, the cool thing about Doula is that it's very fun to think about what technology will come in the future. Oh, generative AI opens up so many doors. It could supplement tooling. It could replace jobs. That's very cool to think about. But I oftentimes think the more interesting question or just as interesting is what's never going to change? What's always going to be here? And that can be things like transportation. I need to get from A to B. But I think entrepreneurship and starting a business is never going to go away. And if you have a business or you're in a space where that's the case, you can play a long-term game, build a strategy and do things to go after that because it's not going to go away. And with Doula, the interesting thing is I can name here what will lead to Doula working or not working. One, we help people form LLCs from anywhere in the world. We do C-Corps too but there are way more LLCs or limited liability companies out there. There's over 20 million active LLCs. There's just over 60,000 active venture-backed C-Corps. Meaning there's way more people out there who aren't raising venture capital. They're just looking to start yeah. a side hustle, sell on Amazon, consult, do marketing, whatever it might be. That being said, those folks typically are spending less than an enterprise business or a mid-market business. Also starting a business is very hard. 20 yeah. to 40% of businesses organically die each year. The stats aren't even, without having a business, the amount of people who start a podcast and don't make it past 10 episodes, 15, whatever the number is, it's very high. Starting anything new is incredibly hard. And that's just organic churn. That's not even because your service or product didn't work. Therefore, our business model and the way we structure things is we want to provide a confident way for you to start the business. Low cost, use automation to streamline, a lot of the manual processes, which typically a lawyer would charge by the hour for. And therefore, you can bring the cost down. So cost-effective, confident, compliant, safe way to get started. But the real way we monetize and make money is by offering additional services for things that are required. Think tax filings with the IRS, annual filings with the state. Oh, do you need a bank account? We can help with that or send you to a partner. What about a domain? What about a website? Do you need to integrate with a different e-commerce platform? All of those types of things, a way that if we can develop and demonstrate that initial trust at formation, we have a long-term customer that we can grow with. But the business doesn't work if one, you can't acquire customers at a low enough acquisition cost 
something which I'm obsessed about is CAC or customer acquisition costs. Yeah. And the reason for that is if you acquire a customer for $1,000, but they only pay you 100, you don't have a business. You have, yeah. I'm losing $900 a customer. It's not it's like a, a charity. A charity, yes. And that flips it if you can acquire customers for $0. And how do you acquire customers by $0? Through channels which compound. By channels, I guess which have asymmetric upside, where yeah. let's say you do a podcast and that podcast very much resonates, people watch, and that leads to future revenue. What works for you when you're done working? Those are the types of things and investments and channels which I'm really obsessed about because especially in our space, LLC formation is a commodity. Anyone can offer LLC formation. You could say, hey, I'll help you set up your LLC and you could just go to the state's website and do it. But things that compound over time, acquisition channels like SEO or content marketing, or channel partnerships, those types of things you invest, you integrate, you set them up, and over time they get more powerful. You'll rank higher on Google for the hundredth article you write once you have a higher domain rating versus the first. For content, once your audience grows, new posts automatically have more reach. Channel partnerships, you build that, and as the company grows, you grow with them too. And knowing those things for Doula, our goal is, hey, even if you don't use us, we wanna educate people. Education is the most important thing. Don't make mistakes for type one decisions, type one decisions. You're going through the door, there's no turning back. It's a one-way street. In this case, yes, if you phone the wrong entity, it's possible to reverse it, but it's time consuming and costly. And we wanna just make sure folks get set up the right way. And the goal is, customers came up with this, they call this this business in a box. It's not just a way to form a company and feel like you've been thrown to the wolves, but it's a way to start the company and have a way to grow that company long-term with a partner who's going to be there for the long-term too. And we can do that for individual consumers if we can use our tech to power other businesses. Entrepreneurship is never going away. And if anything, the craziest thing we've learned is that 4.25% of the world's population is in the US. That means if you're doing the math, 95.75% is outside the US. And the craziest thing to me was that a lot of companies wouldn't even support you if you didn't have a US social. And it's the vast majority of the world. The crazier thing though is most of the world doesn't even realize it's possible to open a US company from outside the US that you can open a business bank account without visiting here too. And that's where I think if we could have a Super Bowl ad for the entire world, letting them know it was possible, you can single-handedly increase entrepreneurship around the world. I think the way you do that is buying that type of Super Bowl ad costs a lot of money, or you can get really good at marketing, content, SEO, et cetera, and cast that net. You can send DMs to people, and that's how you get on people's radars instead of spending money which you don't have for a very expensive Super Bowl ad. Yeah, dude, I mean, the more I did research about your company, the more I read tweets like I've personally helped thousands of founders turn their dream idea into a dream business, which is absolutely amazing. Like the more bullish I am on Doula, the more bullish I am on you and your mission that you're putting out because I'm a huge advocate for entrepreneurship. I think it's a great way to build character, allow you to learn more about yourself than you would ever imagine because when things are, when you're deep in the weeds, you really start to learn about yourself. And I think that's what business does. And I also think it allows you to get more out of the educational system. Like if you're in college and you're learning marketing and you're sitting through your finance class, if you own a business, which I'm somebody who this happened to, I went from being a student that got by and didn't really care too much to learn in the class to actually engage because I'm like, oh, maybe I could apply this to my business when I leave class here. And whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, it helped overall. So I'm super bullish on what you're doing. I think it's absolutely amazing. And I'm so excited to follow the journey with Doula and, and really what you're building. As we come to the end of, of the episode, I asked the same question to everybody. And that's what are you excited about in the near future? I think the biggest thing, and I actually thought about this when I turned 29 back in March. And when I did turn 29, I did this post very cringe, cheesy, et cetera. But I've realized now if it feels cringe, it's good because it means that less people are likely to do it and lean into cringe. It means it's something you have to be shameless to succeed in anything. Sending the DM yep. is shameless, cold calling, et cetera. The post I wrote there was effectively, I just turned 29. Here are 20 things I wish I learned when I was 20, looking backwards. And as part of that post, something I wrote was, whoa, I'm almost 30. And for whatever reason, a lot of people, that's the big three, big zero. Oh no, you're not. Well, I guess you're not an adult anymore when you turn 20, 21 around that time, but it just feels different. And I think something I realized then was 
as arbitrary as that sounds, I was just realizing how do I just attack each day with a new form found of energy? This, the attitude of I don't have to, I get to for everything. Live it like it's your last day, carpe diem to the max. And I think in that sense, I very much look forward to each day. I think that's like the ultimate sign is I know I have something I can sustain when I am something sometimes excited to go to sleep and wake up so I can do it again. If your exercise regimen is humming, you're seeing results, it's compounding. Even after the exercise, I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to get back in the gym tomorrow and do this again because it feels so good. The endorphin rush after, I'm going to see the improvement if I do this 14 times. That was a cop-out answer though. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about coming in. There's very challenging things. A lot of people say that a startup is two emotions, extreme euphoria and extreme terror. Only those two emotions and a lack of sleep amplifies them. That's all you feel. I think that's very true. But to give you a specific, I actually did sign up for my first bodybuilding show in November. That's a fitness challenge I set. Awesome. Uh, never done it before, but I thought, hey, why don't we set this ambitious goal and go towards it? That'll be really fun. And I think the other thing too is there's a lot of just cool initiatives we're going to be launching at Doula as well. Comes back to compounding. When you start a small team, you're not able to build multiple products. But when you have a larger customer base, a customer base which is hopefully captive and you've demonstrated value for it, you can launch additional offerings. The podcast, we, we're starting a podcast for Doula too. That launched this week. There's some new guests that we're going to be interviewing there too. And yeah, really excited there. And I'm really excited to trust the process as much as possible with some of these non-organic channels too. And at the end of the day, I completely agree with you. Pro entrepreneurship, I am pro anyone who's out there taking the chance. That's the hardest, scariest thing to do. Everyone is going to criticize you. Everyone will think about it. But I have ultimate respect for anyone out there trying to improve themselves and trying to make a change. It could be a small side hustle. It could be a moonshot idea. But ultimate kudos to you. I think that's the final thing I will say is that one thing I like to say or think is you have to ignore the crabs. This is a bit morbid, but if you put a bunch of crabs in a bucket and one crab actually tries to crawl out, the other crabs will actually pull it down and break its leg. And the reason for that is because the crab is trying to escape. And those people, those crabs don't want you to go leave the bucket. And in some senses, that does resemble society, where when someone takes that chance and goes for it, really what's happening is it's hitting your insecurities hard about why aren't I doing that? And I don't think it's malicious. It's a natural reaction. In some cases, it can be malicious. But final thing, which I like to think and would say is ignore the crabs, go for it, surround, but surround yourself with people who are doing those things. There's enough naysayers, enough critiques. Take the leap, put yourself out there. You have my ultimate respect. And I'm rooting for anyone doing anything entrepreneurial, taking their shot and going for it. Dude, really, really powerful response. I, I'm super excited for you. I'm super excited for you and, and the team at Doula to accomplish this huge task you guys have ahead of you of really injecting the entrepreneurial spirit that's typically the American dream or here in America, all over the world. And I, I mean, hopefully this show's going on in 10 years still. I want to have you back on because I am super confident that you guys are going to achieve that and be a massive part of entrepreneurship becoming something that everybody thinks they can achieve. And I know you mentioned you have a podcast. It's called The 15 Minute Founder. I'm super excited. I saw you had Sahil Bloom on there as the first episode. I can't wait to check that out. And I'm super excited for you guys to just kill it. Where can people find you? Twitter or LinkedIn under full name Arjun Mahadevan. You can check out Doula. That's D-O-O-L-A dot com. Doula HQ are, or is most of the social handles. And I encourage anyone to shoot your shot, send a message, reach out. If I don't respond, as you've demonstrated and we talked about today, you're not being annoying by following up. You're doing the person a favor. This was awesome. I'm excited for you too. I think you said you're on right. episode 28 or 29. So when you get to 280, 290 or 2,800, whenever that is, <laughs> I'm excited to see when you're there too. Dude, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. I know you've got a bunch of awesome things to do. So I'll let you go. Thank you for coming on the show, man. Awesome. Thanks. This was a ton of fun.